is again important lecture and this this series is very important people are really liking this series of lectures uh today's lecture will be taken by dr raghavendra and uh, i think the introduction of dr dr raghavendra is not required who so has written any article or sent the article in ijpc or otherwise uh, everyone is knowing dr raghavendra but still i want to say something about Rag raghavendra uh raghavendra is uh, right now heading the department of palliative medicine at ester cmi hospital bangalore they have reached the first batch of dnb all over india five places they have started dnb and raghavendra's hospital is one and uh, students have joined and they are doing well raghavendra is chief editor of indian journal of palliative care and after uh, taking a, a huge task uh, after from navi uh, taking care of journal was not not that easy but raghavendra is doing it so well uh raghavendra has also is a uh, is not only a trained in palliative medicine but he is also a expert interventional pain physician and he did fellowship at singapore and usa so he is a, has a thorough knowledge of pain and palliative care and as such uh, raghavendra is very very quiet and he is very disciplined very meticulous in working any aspect if you will say he will do very meticulously everything is being what is uh, coming on his feet so raghavendra everyone is waiting to listen to you what are the antidepressants in palliative care because antidepressant is again another group of drugs where we keep struggling that uh, when to start when not to start how much to start and how much to because there are so many so many things attached to its side effects and other things so raghavendra will explain you everything in this next few uh, 40 45 minutes that what are the ways what are the protocols and what are the protocols and uh, standards we should be using when we are using antidepressant in palliative care thank you raghavendra go ahead please good morning ma'am uh, archana can you hear me yes we can hear yes, you sir. uh this one the slides also seen no yes yeah. sir nicely yeah. okay thank you thank you everybody thank you ma'am for that uh, uh introduction kind introduction you have given an opportunity also for this uh, lecture series it's definitely a, a good important way of learning that is learning for us also who are in the academic uh, part of teaching now the topic assigned to me was antidepressants in palliative care how more important it could be to actually start this topic on monday morning because sunday monday blues is where it starts you're not able to get up but still you've got up to see uh, the, this uh, uh, topic on a monday morning that itself is could be depressing for some of them so therefore it's important and the slide which i have put across is a flower and if you wait up till the end of my uh, slide <clears throat> it's just not to wish you all with a beautiful yellow flower in the morning you'll understand why i put that flower in the morning so the learning objectives what is the introduction receptor actions pharmacology that's kinetics and dynamics clinical use what's the current evidence which could be adverse effects drug interactions recommendations in indian settings if we have some now what are the common psychiatric issues a palliative care population would actually be looking into the most common would be anxiety depression and delirium delirium is something which all of us as palliative care physicians are handling it day in and day out but anxiety and depression is something which at times might require our uh, uh, psychiatrist uh, to actually come and pitch in and to look into what are the various ways of handling it psychologist there is no other doubt at all psychologist definitely is a part of our team wherever it's possible we should have them psycho oncology is preferably more and anxiety and depression is something which will be handled as a consensus as a team rather than as a piece meal with just medicines i think that's the way to go ahead team work team effort is something which is important to handle any symptom burden in our supportive care principles at palliative medicine now what is the symptom prevalence in depression what are the types which could be shown up as and why we would actually get confused now looking at the somatic symptoms there is insomnia loss of appetite lack of concentration fatigue if you ask 
me, if I see any patient with having a life-limiting illness, will have all these aspects being presented to, and they will come up with this, and they will say, saying that I have all of this. But psychological symptoms, let's like lack of interest, withdrawal from family and friends, very low self-esteem, pessimist, fearful. So these are certain things which we should actually actively look into. Why? We will have a lot of these group of patients who would be coming to us. It should not be missed wherein it could be caught up early and appropriate steps would be taken up for the management. Now, where is our incidence? This is exactly where I meant. Look at the range. It could be on an average could be 15%, but the range is around one to 77%. That is almost every third, every third patient is not your uh, patient is in depression. Otherwise, everybody could be in depression uh, in, in terms of what you call as a, 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 a third, fourth patient coming in and sitting and discussing with you should be actually thinking in terms of whether this person has got any of the psychological issues or concerns. Specific to depression could be this. Now, if you don't look into, if you don't have a thought, then it is going to get underdiagnosed and it will definitely lead to undertreatment. If it leads to undertreatment, the psychological issues and concerns will lead to a lot of other uh, concerns in the symptom control and that reduces quality of life. Now, depression leading to any other symptom management, will it be a problem? Definitely, yes. Now, that is pain. We know that pain is could be very, very difficult and depression adding on to it will be another problem together and fatigue. These are two issues and concerns which will actually get multi, multiply and lead to a lot of issues. And it becomes a circle wherein issues and concerns worsen over a period of time. And once it starts becoming chronic with other issues and concerns of treatment not happening or treatment not be fruitful or any of the other uh, issues which could be coming up on the various phases of management of a patient in their trajectory of disease will lead to flaring up of these concerns more and more if not appropriately handled at the start and as we go on with the treatment now depression is it only a concern which is just only a neurotransmitter issue? That is what we are going to discuss basically today. That is the neurotransmitter imbalance, but it could be because of neuroinflammation. I'll come up with neuroinflammation issues also. I'll just put it across in a slide in the next one. Whereas impairment in neurogenesis, that is degeneration, a older age and other kind can lead to a lot of decreased hippocampal volume and hippocampus uh, atrophy leading to decreased uh, uh, release of these uh, enzymes and hormones and leading to a lot of other concerns. Now, synapses also actually get starts dysfunctioning when you have a chronic pain, chronic other issues can lead to a lot of abnormal signaling or decreased signaling or dysregulation in these signalings. Now, which are the extracellular signal related kinases and the serine and theronine protein kinases could be one of them. Now, are we going to discuss in total all of these? It's not possible in this class. So what I would be focusing on is mainly the neurotransmitter imbalance, which we would actually be talking in the next 45 minutes. Now, where is the mechanism of depression when it comes to receptor as well as the, the uh, treatment per se? It's as simple in these steps. Now you can see at the synapse in the brain, where exactly I would come in the next slide. Now, these are two different dopamine and serotonin. Now, once these are released, it is a normal activity, which actually is the transmission happens and electrical signal is passed on and the issues and concerns are none. Now, in a patient who is actually depressed, you can see the number of these released, that is the neurotransmitters are going to come down. That is the dopamine and serotonin. Now, this would lead to depression in simple terms. Now in treatment, we are going to do various ways. Either these receptors are going to be stimulated, whether there are going to be uh, in terms of more release, rele release is there. Then after that uptake is not much or destruction is not much. So these are the three ways we are going to handle in a nutshell. Coming to the neurotransmitters, which are the neurotransmitters we would be interested in? There are two neurotransmitters basically, which are very, very important. Serotonin, the happy neurotransmitter is what? This is the crux of all our 
could be in terms of your psychological concerns related to depression. So this is the one which makes you happy. That's a simple way of understanding it. Now, chronic stress leads to low serotonin level. Please have this in your thought. I will show the next slide. Now, if you are doing good exercises, going out, meeting people, making uh, friends, talking to them, getting to actually eat good food, healthy food, uh, sleeping on a regular basis, make, maintaining circadian rhythm will all lead to better levels of uh, the uh, serotonin in your brain. Now, why is it better? Because uh, the, the serotonin transporter activity actually is uh, this decrease. So therefore, it is not picked up and, and removed off. It's there. It's available readily whenever there is an issue or a concern. So therefore, depression is not going to happen in this. Now, where do we have serotonin? Is it only in the brain? Only 10% is in the brain, whereas 90% in the gut. So this has got a very big relevance to our own uh, mechanism of understanding. That is, if you go into ancient uh, ways of understanding how you should have a, uh, getting up in the morning, you need to have uh, the right way of taking bath, doing things for you, making you comfortable, having to wear better clothes, eating good food, sleeping on a eight hour basis, having a routine. All these things have a very important thing, aspect of uh, uh, reducing depression. So therefore, gut has got 90%. So therefore, if you're handling all of it, it is interlinked to your brain issues or depression also could come down here. Now, is there a single pathway wherein serotonin can actually get stimulated or it could have a feedback or how it is going to happen in the brain wherein transmission of the serotonin? There are more than 20 known pathways and recollecting all of them is going to be impossible. It might not be required also. The next neurotransmitter which we are talking about is dopamine, a chemical which is mainly for motivation. So if you are people who are motivated to take action towards goals and desires and needs, these are the important aspects which dopamine will bring about. Now, it reinforces pleasure once the goal is accomplished also. Therefore, if you have a, a set of people who would come to you and say saying that I am not getting up properly, I don't feel like getting up, I have not been able to actually do things. I think dopamine is also very, very important to motivate them to do things. Whereas I get up and I'm not able to actually maintain this. I'm not able to actually feel better. I think serotonin could be an issue over here. So pharmacological management is not the only way to improve this neurotransmitter. Please bear that in mind. Why I'm actually mentioning all of this is you should look into non-pharmacological ways of handling it. You should look into a holistic way of management. That is what is pain and palliation all about. Now, coming to the specifics of nitty-gritty, where you have the serotonin and dopamine. Now, serotonin, look at the red ones, wherever it is. Mainly, it's concentrated in the brainstem area, mid-brain stem. Now, it is the raphe nucleus wherein it actually picks up and it's there everywhere around. Now, we have already put across the function of serotonin. It improves the mood, memory processing, sleep, cognition. Now, sleep, cognition, memory processing and mood. Is it related to something called as a problem in pain? Absolutely, yes. There is a condition called as fibromyalgia, which is directly related. If you look into what are the concerns of them, the patients will have all these plus GI disturbances, urinary bladder disturbances, skin disturbances. So it is related to this. So if you have a patient who is overtly depressed and issues and concerns, you could have myofascial pains and other concerns too. Now, the other neurotransmitter we spoke about is the dopamine. Where's the dopamine? Substantia Niagara, wherein it is more for your Parkinson management and other things. I think Parkinson has already been dealt with my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Amelia here, and it was extensively important to understand how it is uh, going to make it better. Whereas the VTA, the, the ventral tegmental area, is the one which actually is more important for the frontal cortex. The, when the frontal cortex is, uh, cortex is stimulated, it leads to reward, motivation, pleasure, euphoria, motor functioning. That is fine tuning of your motor, as well as compulsion and preservation is something which could actually be here. Now, as I mentioned, depression, 
the first neurotransmitter which all of us should think about is serotonin. Is serotonin developed per se by itself? No. Tryptophan is the precursor, is the amine. It gets hydroxylated to 5-hydroxytryptophan and then decarboxylated mainly to form the serotonin. Look at here, it's just not going to have emotional stress and others or the brain issues and concerns. It will have a GI effect also because the gut has got a lot of it. That is gastric secretions, gastric motility, intestinal secretions, colonic tone, pancreatic secretions. So therefore, all of this could be there. Now, it also regulates the, the motor control, circadian rhythm, cerebellar regulation, body temperature, CNS. So if there is a problem in one of these aspects, it could relate to having a problem in the other. So therefore, it is vice versa phenomenon. We will not be able to segregate whether it is brain which is more important or the gut which is important. So therefore, it is also known as the brain-gut axis. Now, if you have a bad micro, microbial infection or a flora in, infection in your GI system and your GI system is not working, functioning properly at all, the serotonin going back would be less. So therefore, there could be ill effects. And as I'd mentioned, neurotransmitter will have, once chronic, will have a lot of neuroplasticity and other problems which will become permanent. So these are certain aspects which we need to look into. At the same time, once there is a chronic issue, you need to act not just by pharmacological way, you need to act on other mechanisms which are available and it's a team effort and it has to be driven backwards. It takes its own time. It cannot happen in a day or two. So please bear this in mind. Now serotonin uh, cycle, as I mentioned, from tryptophan to hydroxytryptophan to serotonin to acetyl serotonin is where we have. Now the last of the uh, group uh, which actually gets converted is melatonin. So here, the function of melatonin is circadian rhythm, sleep-wake cycle, immune function, antioxidants. That is something which I wanted to bring about in this slide. Now, all of these, it could be a precursor. Where will we get this? The building block, that's the tryptophan is eggs, fish, soya beans, cheese, seeds, poultry, meat, milk, and chocolates. I think that's where our neurologically, we are going to feel a little bit better because chocolates do contain nuts and others. So please actually have a healthy meal to have your serotonin balance better starting from monday to going up till saturday yeah friday night and other things could be a different aspect altogether now friday night food is not good for us is what i mentioned because alcohol binge eating binge drinking all of these are not good so therefore we will start and keep the entire week better with the source of tryptophan now, interrelationship, I had actually mentioned saying that anxiety, depression is something which could be there in anybody. And that could lead to sleep disturbance over a period of time. And that would lead to myofascial pains and muscle issues. And the chronicity, the, the irritability and other things will go up. And it's a circle. And it leads to an interchangeable problem after a period of time. So all of this put together would lead to a functional impairment which the patient would feel saying that I'm not being able to work to the capacity. Might not be related to pain at all, but he would actually put across his thoughts or depression as pain, his sleep disturbance as pain, as irritability as pain. So therefore, you would have to look into a patient who is coming primarily with pain, also with other co concepts of depression or mood issues and sleep disturbance. So please do not actually leave any of these unattended. Now, depression will lead to sleep deprivation. Hyperanalytic states will be there over a period of time because of neuroplasticity, decrease in neuromodulation. That is the inhibitory pathway, which is actually the descending pathway becomes less over here. And the increased excitatory, that is the neural plasticity increases, the neurotransmitter also for that increases. The concurrent management of all these should happen together. It cannot be piecemeal. I will handle pain at one point of time. I will handle psychological issues and concerns at one point of time and sleep in a different. No, it's not possible. Now, when you have chronic pain, it's advisable to actually have uh, the, the problems uh, countered with could be a circadian rhythm to be followed, how the sensitivity patterns are there, how the patient is being socially being actually looked into. Basically, what I mean to say is our total pain concept, which has been put across in palliative medicine, that actually should be there. With that, a team effort should always be there looking into a betterment. Now, coming to the receptors, as I mentioned, we were actually talking about the serotonin, which is the biggest of all the concerns in your 
uh, these the, the depression to be avoided and that's the most commonest of all in the synaptic cleft as i had mentioned in the, in the various uh, uh, areas of the brain norepinephrine receptors are also present both in the post synaptic neuron so this is one and the other one is the serotonin now what happens is once the calcium is actually entering because of the signal which is coming up and the calcium is released from packets it releases the uh, the neurotransmitter it could be norepinephrine or serotonin primarily i would actually bring about serotonin more and serotonin would lead to uh, binding of these receptors that's in the postsynaptic neuron leads to the activity being transmitted that's the neuronal activity gets transmitted norepinephrine on the other hand is also very very important to a large extent wherein the neural transmission has to happen now norepinephrine is just not related to psychological issues and concerns it is related to other aspects of uh, our own daily to daily activity could be in terms of pain management also so therefore whenever we are actually having medications which are going to be prescribed we are going to not just look into ssris we are going to look into snris wherein you have pain accompanying a patient who is actually having psychological or mood disturbances mainly working on the inhibitory mechanism i will come to that in the one of my slides wherein i will show where else the antidepressants work on the pain pathway so once the calcium is really uh, is actually entering into the into the into the presynaptic neuron then it releases from the vesicles the neurotransmitter gets into the postsynaptic neuron as i had mentioned now once the neurotransmitter is actually there it's done its job it gets back by the reuptake uh, 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 reuptake uh, happens of these neurotransmitters either it is going to get destroyed by the monoamine oxidase over here you can see the key element or it enters into the vesicle back to actually form uh, a group or a concentration wherein it is again released next if it is not destroyed completely now what are antidepressants do what is the basic antidepressant which is actually been used most of it is tricyclic antidepressants which is the commonest of all which we could actually be using as a uh, as a palliative care physician we might not be using it to the extent of wherein uh, a depression doses are there but at a lower dose wherein for pain management specifically we could be using or in terms of neuropathic pain specific specified to so tricyclic antidepressants do not have any a uh, differentiation between norepinephrine receptor or serotonin receptor they actually block both leading to a decrease in re, uh, the the reuptake of the uh, neurotransmitter that is norepinephrine as well as the serotonin so therefore you have more in the synaptic cleft itself of these neurotransmitters the binding towards the receptors is there so the postsynaptic neuron will pick up these signals and actually be stimulated to a larger extent or you can have the selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors which could be there in leading to uh, 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 the neurotransmitter which is going to block only the norepinephrine over here it is not going to block the 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 serotonin uh, receptor selective if it is norepinephrine whereas uh, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors that is both they will also block norepinephrine as well as the the uh, serotonin receptors both for the reuptake now selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors will actually block only the serotonin reuptake whereas norepinephrine you can see here it's going back into the reuptake mechanism and vesicles are filled or it's broken down by the monoamine oxidase now you have inhibitors which is going to inhibit this monoamine oxidase itself so whatever is reuptaked is not going to get destroyed because these oxidase or the enzyme is actually going to be blocked so therefore this neurotransmitter free dig enters here gets accumulated or concentration increased so it will be readily available for release so either we are going to reduce reuptake or we are going to reduce destruction this is where the basic mechanism of our antidepressant medications work into now to add on to this are there any other ways of actually improving it yes you have receptor antagonists 
primarily in the presynaptic itself that is disinhibits serotonin noradrenaline release that is release of it itself increases like mirtazapine or trazodone or postsynaptic that is disinhibits monoamine release elsewhere that is it does not actually lead to destruction anywhere else or monoamine release is inhibited so therefore the desired action is actually going on now it could lead to what is basically this neurotransmitter lead to it leads to nerve growth or it it leads to a, a, a action wherein the neural uh, transmission leads to a improvement in your um, cognition improvement in your mood improvement in your other thoughts now clinical uses of of these antidepressant is it only used for depression no it could be used for neuropathic pain as i mentioned the intricacies and interrelated uh, aspect of the gut the flora of the gut or your neurological well being circadian rhythm sleep wake cycle mood all of it so therefore pain is also interlinked to that leading to a treatment by our antidepressants it could be used in insomnia it could be used in pleuritis hot flushes siluria and bladder over activity now insomnia and other things followed down could be the utilization could be very very small so majority of our usage is in depression and neuropathic pain now which are the group of antidepressants which we actually look into now uh, tricyclic antidepressants are the most commonest and amitriptyline nortriptyline are the commonest of all the uh, medications which we use mav inhibitors that is phenylalanine nilamidine isocarboxazide hydrocarboxazine these are ones which are not much used uh, as palliative care physicians i think psychiatrists are the group of people who would use and why is it to be used with caution is something i'll come up with ssri is something which is definitely used by us also commonly used fluoxetine sertraline one of the most uh, stable medications less of interactions could be used citalopram acetylopram is something which more could be in terms of handling with the best of all the group of medications we have ssris are the commonest prescribed medications now snris norepinephrine reuptake inhibitions which are there then venlafaxine desvenlafaxine duloxetine i think that's the commonest which we would write when a patient has already has pain issues and concerns norepinephrine dopamine that is a combination reuptake inhibition vipron is vipropion is where we can actually look into now the other class of drug which could be the noradrenergic alpha 2 receptor antagonist with specific serotonin receptor mirtazapine this is a group of other group of drug atypical antipsychotics that exhibit weak d2 receptor antagonism with potentially strong 5h2a receptor blockade olanzapine quetiapine risperidone could be some of them the nmda which can actually increase the levels of mood ketamine i think i would not be going into all of this more of my concentration to be towards would be wherein i have been using in my own clinical practice wherein tricyclic antidepressant snri and ssris mav inhibitors or patients who are really really having psychiatric uh, issues i would definitely refer it to our psychiatric colleague and and work it as a team as a consensus to actually make the symptom better now coming to the first and the commonest of all tricyclic antidepressant now what are the pharmacokinetics it is lipid soluble it is given orally other routes are not approved it's very well absorbed and peak concentration occurs within 2 to 6 hours itself it is bound to strongly to the albumin you can see the bioavailability it's almost 40 to 50% ssris are much much higher in bioavailability the distribution is is in more of extravascular tissue and it has got a very large distribution around 10 to 50 liters now whether it's um, demethylization or uh, aromatic hydroxylation gluconeogenic deconjugation all of this are going to be the uh, ways of actually metabolizing it now people will be having poor metabolizers or ultra rapid metabolizers predominantly depending upon what is the cytochrome p450 they have now if uh, they have predominantly cyp 2d6 predominantly they could have an issue or concern of pro or poor meta, uh, metabolizers or ultra rapid when they having c 2c19 uh, leading to a lot of metabolism over here therapeutic concentration 50 to 300 nanograms per ml excretion less than 50% of the dose of tricyclic 
antidepressant is uh, eliminated unchanged. That means most of it is metabolized in the liver. Now, what are the site of action where it's going to have uh, the issues and concerns? Now, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the Sorry. Use of tricyclic anti in, in palliative medicine include treatment of neuropathic pain, chronic pain conditions, enuresis, insomnia, and depression. So it could be used in all of it. For per se, where we actually commonly write is neuropathic pain to start off with, or sleep and myofascial concerns, especially young individuals. Tricyclic antidepressants is something which I don't use in elderly because of its side effect profile, or Patients who have had head and neck cancers and who have post-radiation, post-chemotherapy, that is concurrent chemoradiation will lead to a lot of dryness, oral activity issues. And it has got uh, concerns of, of, of problem of salivation itself. Dryness of eyes also could be there, which could be a problem, especially in elderly. Now, elderly patients could have urinary disturbances, cardiac issues, which could be aggravated by tricyclic antidepressants. Now, what are the factors which metabolize lead to the effect of tricyclic antibiotic uh, metabolism? Genetics, as I mentioned, of the C, uh, CY450P450, age it could be. Mainly, actually, it is better in the younger compared to elder, where it get, get actually accumulated. Gen, gender, mainly women will have more issues and concerns, especially nursing mothers. Alcohol consumption will lead to an induction of this enzyme or smoking will indu induce this enzyme so therefore they could ultra rapidly actually get metabolized. Drug to drug interactions are seen in them. Now, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitions, it is actually as I mentioned in the previous slide, it inhibits the reuptake or the transmotor mechanism of the serotonin, SCRT. Now it is actually the delayed disinhibition of serotonergic neuro neural transmission in all the four key pathways that occur. And how many of them are there? At least seven to eight different types of receptors are there in the serotonin, which lead to a class of issues and concerns. Now, among this, uh, the, the most of the drug which is used is the fluoxetine. Bioavailability is very, very high. That is 90% the per orally itself. Now, T half, uh, the max is around four to eight hours. Now, if you're actually using it, the plasma half-life is around one to four days, but it could actually be as high as one to two weeks also. So therefore, we should have a sustained way of dealing with this medication. And metabolism of all the SSRIs are multiple pathways, and it cannot happen only in the liver. It can happen at other places also. Sertaline, which is actually the other drug which is used uh, as a T max is six to eight hours and the half-life is around 26 hours. That is almost a, a day. It is metabolized mainly in the uh, liver. Now, the pharmacokinetics uh, parameters of SSRIs and the enzymes, I think what I wanted to actually mention over here is the daily dosage. It's around 20 to 80 mg and sertraline is around 50 to 150 mg. Now, fluoxetine is something which I would be happy to write at the lower doses or the simplest of all, which I would be using is certain in 50. But certainly if the patient actually on, after uh, psychological concerns and issues have been managed, and if I'm used a small amount of medications and if I'm not able to get better, I would definitely seek the help of a psychiatrist over here, not wasting too much of, of time here. Now, different drugs, The differences between SSRIs is something which wherein the hepatic inhibition or the where it's going to actually be looked into in terms of inhibition of these enzymes are looked into. This is very, very important wherein you have drug to drug interactions or there is something called as the discontinuation reaction. I will come to that in the later part of the discussion. Now you look at uh, fluoxetine, there is minimal Whereas sertraline is very, very low. So therefore, when you're discontinuing, if you actually don't discontinue it on a stage manner, you could have responses or reactions like with specifically like drugs like paroxetine. So therefore, when you are actually started the medication and you want to reduce it, you have to bear in the mind that they're saying that you're going to have this kind of response. SNRIs, selective norepinephrine reuptake. Uh, inhibitors, 
which is actually having more on norepinephrine, less on the serotonin pathway. Venlafaxine and duloxetine is one. Venlafaxine is actually uh, approved earlier by FDA, whereas duloxetine came in uh, later on. Desvenlafaxine followed up. Now you can look at your major depression is where you actually use SNRIs. Now it is there for all these drugs and specifically when to use what I've, I would use only when duloxetine is actually the drug of choice for pain as well as depression at a lower doses. When it, higher doses are there, I don't, I don't actually do a lot of pharmaco pharmacological management then definitely I would actually send it off across to a psychiatrist. Now, wherein you have issues and concerns of the chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy or diabetic uh, neuropathy associated with your patient actually who is actually undergoing any form of management. Now, you can see that these are very well managed by duloxetine and it is FDA indication for it, itself itself. Now, all these SNRIs, where do they actually get metabolized? Most of it is in the hepatic. It's all by the P450. Whereas the later generation ones are not uh, by mainly by hepatic, it is minimal, but uh, not related to P450, though therefore drug interactions, drug issues and concerns are less. That's what I wanted to mention over here. Now, metabolites are something which are seen in desvenylafexine uh, uh, and duloxetine, whereas in the newer ones, there are none. Now, what is the ratio of binding to serotonin and the norepinephrine, the ratio. Now, if you have 30 molecules, it will going to actually act on the, the serotonin, whereas one molecule itself is enough. So 30 is to one is the ratio with venlafaxine. Duloxetine is 10 is to one. So this is where you could look into. Now, mirtazapine is one of the class of the drugs which I had mentioned as the noradrenergic alpha receptor 2 antagonist with specific serotonin receptors 2 and 3 antagonism. So this actually leads to a specific activation of these alpha 2 heteroreceptors, which is present in the dorsal raphe nuclei, in the, mainly in the brainstem itself. Now, the pharmacokinetics is 20 to 40 hours when taken orally, it is available orally uh, in terms of the bioavailability. Now, no active metabolites are there. No significant inhibitors are there, but it is definitely in the liver itself, it is metabolized by the cytochrome P450. It's, um, there is no other drug-to-drug -drug interactions with met metazapine. Now, transporter mechanism is what becomes very, very important when we are looking into The receptor affinities are, are for the selected uh, antidepressants and the transporters are very, very important. I think uh, recollecting each and every aspect over here becomes very difficult. But if you look at it, what I wanted to stress upon is I spoke about serotonin. I spoke about dopamine. I spoke about norepinephrine. Now, addition to that, if the side effects and other problems do occur or unwanted effects are there, mainly because of acetylcholine or the other ones which are here, the H1 receptors, the skin reactions and others, and alpha because of BP and other things could actually go about. Norepinephrine, noradrenaline also will raise to cardiac issues, cardiac events. So these are certain aspects which we need to actually look into. That is, our drugs do not have specific action only on these. Do they do have a reaction or effect on other receptors which could bring about the problems or the side effects in our treating patients? Coming to the treatment per se, there is no immediate effect. You start an antidepressant. Is it going to bring about a change in the pharmacokinetics? Yes. But is it going to actually bring about a change in your somatic symptoms or your psychological symptoms immediately? I don't think so. Why? There is a lot of the, these uh, amines which are or the neurotransmitters which increase in their concentration levels. But is that enough? No. Once a problem is already there for a chronic period of time or it is not picked up for a period of time, 
it brings about a lot of neural plasticity. As I'd mentioned, saying that new pathways are formed, new concerns are already there, new transmitters are already there, which are going to stimulate our, or cause more concerns in terms of your neural dysregulation. That would lead to less of the sensitivity to these neural transmitters and more and more number of neural uh, synaptic vesicles are in are needed to actually increase over a period of time. That is where it is going to bring about the change. And this has to be a sustained way, a sustained activity, not just by pharmacological methods. I think non-pharmacological methods should not be forgotten over here. And as I mentioned, there's no one medical treatment and that medical treatment leading to the entire change bring the, brought about in depression. I think we should look into all the aspects of the uh, change in the lifestyle itself. So there are a lot of other concerns when a patient is in depression. Please don't neglect them. You have to treat them. To mention some, hypercalcemia it could be. It could be related to dehydration. It could be related to others over a period of time, which could lead to a change. Hypothyroidism it could be. Related to less activity it could be. Just sleeping in bed, even a person who's actually having ECOG-3 or ECOG-4 and he's able to move his hands, is able to move his shoulder, is able to move his limb, is a biofeedback going on saying that I'm better, I'm okay. So these are certain aspects which we need to in, look, look into from the non-pharmacological aspects, as I've mentioned. And treatment of comorbidities, it could be any of the uh, comorbidities like diabetes and others, which could bring about concerns and problems. So therefore, you will have to treat all of them which will reduce both depression as well as if there's a concurrent pain going on, please handle that also together. So therefore, that also could be reduced, improving the physical function, improving the psychological state as well as sleep and overall leads to quality of life. Now, how do we start treating them? Do we start treating them all of a sudden or how do we actually look into this when in a clinical scenario, when your patient is actually there? The simplest of all is used to use the NCC and distress thermometer, wherein you will have to least find out if there are concerns or not. As you would do a, a patient who would come into your clinic, your clinical nurse could actually look into this or even better if you have a psychologist in your group. Now, once you actually have a nurse and if they're able to fill this up and or ask them at least if they're able to actually fill up and if there are emotional problems and things and at to what level of distress they have, you will actually get, get that, at least you're going to hold them early. As you would actually measure a BP the temperature, SpO2 or respiratory rate, you actually would need to actually measure this unless and until you don't start doing this, you might not get to that. Now, depression per se is actually going to be uh, checked by the patient health question, a PHQ-9, that's the best of all. Now, if you have at least three or four ticks into this, you will need to have a psychiatrist being seen, that is four plus, that is major depression. Now, how do we guide? It's got about 10 questions and the scoring system is there. Now, if you give this and administer them, you, they would be able to actually come to a consensus which would be there, which would be a part of their life every day. Now, once that is there, you sum up the score. Now, zero to four, none or minimal depression. So therefore proposed treatment is none. If it's mild, we have to wait, repeat in the next follow-up, the PHQ-9. Moderate review treatment plan, if not imposing in past four weeks, consider discussion to add support such as pharmacotherapy here itself. Moderately severe. Now treatment plan and frequency of sessions should be in, looked into if they're able to come regularly of a don't able to come, especially in this group of, uh, in this duration post COVID, you have having a lot of this depression and other things and patient is not ready to come. They will say saying that, please, can you give me a teleconsult itself? And most of them, even the children are actually very happy saying that teleconsults are happening, but most of it could go completely missed. Discuss additional support as pharmaco pharmacotherapy in moderately severe. I think in moderately severe and above, Psychologist is definitely involved at this point of time. Psychiatrist involvement is wherein it becomes relevant. Now, if it's more than 20 to 27, I think psychiatrist is where would deal with appropriately. Now, going on the stepwise pattern of management, low intensity psychosocial issues, interventions of all of it, it could be inclusive of counseling, CBT and other things could be 
the best to start off with. Antidepressants could be there. You could actually increase the uh, dose if it's necessary, or CBT could be added on. Now, step three, moderate depression in response, combine antidepressants and CBT or increase switch to antidepressants. I think at this point of time, step three, I would not be dealing with it. The psychiatrist would be dealing with it. Now, this is step four is what it mentions. Please uh, seek advice of psychiatrist. And I think I would be more comfortable actually at step three itself. There could be psychiatrists, various psychiatrists of my colleagues who have actually trained in palliative medicine. I think they would be actually much, much more happy to manage the entire gamut. Now, first line in depression would be sertraline and citalopram because of its fewer drug interactions, lower risk of overdose, better tolerated, as I'd mentioned from the start of my slides itself. The second line or the escalation would be metazapine or venlafaxine. You don't see a response in four to six weeks of starting your first primary line, that is sertraline or citalopram, or if you see a partial response even after eight weeks, that is where you're going to have the second group of drug, that is metaz or venlafaxine. Escalation is only indicated to be wherever there is minimal side effect profile, which has been seen. Otherwise, you are not going to just escalate the first line itself. You're going to add the second line. If the side effects are more, you're just going to replace it with a newer drug. So therefore, replacement is directly substituted without actually tapering or washout time is then mainly for SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Now, the tricyclic antidepressants and MAO inhibitors, we have to be very, very careful for drug interactions and they could actually lead to a lot of problems when de-escalating or stopping or changing these. I think a psychiatrist would be the best person to look into. These are the doses variously used and I have mentioned the lower doses is what I'm more comfortable. The higher doses is something which I'm not. See, look at the tricyclic to give you an example. Tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline starts at 150 mg for your uh, antidepressant. I won't be using that level of uh, concentrations or that level of medications itself. So these are the ones which could be used for at various levels, but with appropriate uh, by guidance by the psychiatrist. Duration of treatment, you'll have to actually use this until full remission of your diseases there, as well as the depression goes about. And you're going to continue that uh, after about for at least six months and slowly taper it down. Now, if you have a patient with previous depression, severity is very, very severe when you had diagnosed or the treatment is was a resistant and you had changed multiple drugs to get it at least one year down the lane, you're going to continue that. Whereas palliative care, until I think it's until survival. If the survival is less than four weeks, there is no role for antidepressants. I think you have to go for psychostimulants directly. <clears throat> Discontinuation reaction or withdrawal syndrome, if it's more than eight weeks and if it's abrupt, then it's going to be a problem. MAV inhibitors are the ones which have the significant issue. Short half-life, it's going to have the significant concern. Longer half-lives will not have that concern when you are because it's slowly getting eliminated. Discontinuation re reaction that is going to be confused with depression relapse. How discontinu discontinuation reaction is something which is seen in days to occur, whereas depression relapse is going to occur in, in weeks. That is, discontinuation reaction occurs immediately. It's an acute phenomenon. Depression over a period, it's a chronic phenomenon. Now, resolves within 24 hours of restart. That is discontinuation reaction, whereas depression would take it to actually bind, get back the changes over a long period of time is what it takes. Now, these are the ones which will cause a lot of issues. And I think I'll, I'll slide, so the slide will be sent to you. You could go through the list of it. Now, sleep and others is something which I've mentioned. Interaction with pain is something which I've mentioned. Now, where do the pharmacology of sight for action of pain management when it comes to antidepressants? Now, it could be in the spinal cord level itself. As I'd mentioned, it brings about more neuromodulation and inhibition is where you can look into. Now, it could be actually at the central sensitizer, that's the dorsal horn itself at the spinal cord level, the tricyclic antidepressants as well as the SNRIs. SNRIs, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors would be the most important of all the drugs. Peripheral sensitization also, it could work in by the TCAs as, as well and the antidepressants. Now, this is where you're going to have the neuropathic pain being managed. 
it was a, a, a paper which was actually uh, come up in BMC some time ago. It was actually the management of neuropathic pain with systematic review of 16 uh, guidelines which were there put together. Now, you can see there are various international bodies from International Association of Pain to the other French, it could be Danish, it could be, or the NICE guidelines. The first line of drug could be TCAs or SNRIs. So this is where you could use your pain medications or for your neuropathic pain. Now, it could be a part of your second line as well as your third line also. So please look into pain management whenever. Fourth line is some of the drugs of the SSRIs could be there. <clears throat> the <clears throat> number needed to treat for tricyclic antidepressants is around 3.6. Now the SNRIs is around 6.4. So every third patient could get 50% response, whereas SNRIs, every sixth or seventh patient could get a 50% response. Now, these are the, the dosages which we could look into. The, the serotonin not in reuptake inhibitors, 60 to 1 mg of duloxetine, 150 to 225 of vanilla Tricyclic antidepressants, 25 to 150 mg maximum, whereas your psychiatric medication or your antidepressant starts from 150. So that's where I wanted to mention here. Now, other uses, as I did, sweating, antimuscarinic action of the tricyclic antidepressants could be used. Hot flushes, mainly because of hormonal therapy or, or menopause, SSRIs and venlafaxine. Insomnia, tricyclic antidepressants at small doses. In India, even 5 mg of TCS in younger individuals can lead to beautiful sleep being better, circadian rhythm getting restored, as well as the myofascial issues and concerns will reduce. Puritis. Sertaline and doxepin because of its H1 inhibition. Bladder spasms, antimuscarinic action again. Drooling, mainly because of decreased salivation by antimuscarinic action of TCAs. You have a lot of caution which needs to be looked into. Suicidal risks <clears throat> whenever you're starting, especially when younger than 25 years. SSRIs and have got more issues and concerns compared to TCAs. And age of more than 25 years, non-fatal self-harm is what we could see, especially in elderly individuals. Epilepsy could be dose-dependent uh, reduction in the seizure threshold. TCAs are much, much more here compared to SSRIs. Highest with clomipramine. Hyponatremia also would be induced by these drugs at, at places, leads to seizures. Now, citalopram is the drug which is favored in epileptics. Parkinson's, I think it could lead to extraperimental symptom being worsened because of the 5 ht 2 receptor inhibition. TCAs actually worsen the autonomic function due to alpha blockade, cognitive impairment because of acetylcholine blockade. Now, when you're using MAV inhibitors, generally it's not preferred in palliative care. Multiple drugs and fluid interactions are seen over here. It leads to a lot of hypertensive crisis is seen. It could lead to severe headache as well as intracranial hemorrhage. Toxicity with opioids are there. There are a lot of food which actually have the interaction or tyramine containing foods which could lead to a lot of interaction with MAV inhibitors. Now, these are some of the foods which actually will be there. Now, serotonin syndrome is something which I have to mention over here because that is where you will have a lot of concerns or serotonin syndrome. There was a case, that's the Libby Zion case, which she was taking uh, phenylephrine because she, she had issues of depression. She was actually did present too with fever, agitation and strange jerking motion movement because of its uh, concerns or issues or side effects itself. But once she came into the ER, she was prescribed meperidine. That led to a lot of concerns of the serotonin syndrome leading to a temperature going to 107 and cardiac arrest and death. That's the famous case of Libizion. And that led to a change in the, 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 the uh, management or the training itself of the residents. Now, serotonin syndrome, potentially it's a life-limiting concern adverse drug reactions could be there therapeutic drug interactions uh, the, there is self poisoning also could be there it's a triad of mental changes autonomic hyperactivity and neuromuscular abnormalities it could be in all age groups 14 to 16 percent who have overdose of ssris now the symptoms include diaphoresis tachycardia agitation improved bowel sounds may have diarrhea also they have hypertensive crisis. They have neurological issues of clonus, tremors, hyperreflexia. Midriasis could be there. I think mental changes you need to look into autonomic issues and neuromuscular abnormalities. It could be mild, moderate, or severe, depending upon the 
temperature or your mental state or your neuromuscular excitation. That's the three components which I have decreased uh, or bog, come down into. Now, treatment could be from starting from mild to severe. Now, if it is mild, discontinuation of the offending agent, supportive IV therapy, vitals to be managed, benzodiazepines is the best, observe for 20 to 24 hours. Moderate, then you start cooling measures because hyperthermia is going to be there. Now, bladder wash could be GI. You could actually introduce a Riles tube and actually give a wash. Whereas if it's severe, then you are going to treat as if you're treating a hyperthermia case. Now, you could use dantrolene sodium over here, or you could paralyze the patient, put him onto a ventilator, as well as decrease his metabolic activity. For paralyzing, please don't use uh, succinylcholine, which actually brings about rhabdomyolysis and more issues of hyperkalemia. Now, directly against the serotonin itself, the cyproheptidine could be one, chromopyramosine could be others, but benzodiazepine becomes the best drug over there. To neuromuscular block, vecuronium would be the best. Now, prevention is best in, to, or to avoid serotonin syndrome. So, pharmacological principles, educating clinicians, modifying prescription uh, practice, multi-drug regimen should be avoided as much as possible. So, there are group A and group B drugs out of which we should not. And you could look, MAV inhibitors and antidepressants when they're combined can cause a lot of issues and concerns. So when you're actually need to prescribe, please go through this list. Now, in issues and concerns which are <clears throat> QT prolongation could be there. The lowest would be with uh, the desphenylphexine and duloxetine, whereas high with amitriptyline. So therefore, when you have a patient already on QT prolongation medications like methadone, it could be, or any of those, uh, uh, medications, you could have specific to anti-TB medications, or you could be with antiretroviral also. You should be very, very uh, concerned about this, especially in elderly individual. Now, drug interactions could be, you could look at these, it could be anti-viral, uh, it could be anti-arrhythmic drugs, anti-psychotic drugs, anti-epileptic drugs also. I think this is something which you need to look because of its liver issues and concerns wherein the cytochrome P450 is going to be a concern, wherein it's going to decrease the metabolism or increase the metabolism. I think I've, I'm actually have another five minutes. I'll, I've got another two slides. You have three minutes, Raghavinder, and there are a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, ma'am. So in the Indian context, do you have specific antidepressants? I think I, we don't have a specific evidence for that specific to antidepressants, but we had a publication. Madam was also part of this publication, Sushma ma'am, um, wherein we had mentioned saying that tricyclic antidepressants are good for pain management. Number needed to harm is 13.4. Number needed to treat is 3.6. Whereas SNRI is 6.4 and 11.8. Now, do we have a... Uh, a guideline, at least the grading recommendation, yes, grade A, wherein it comes to antidepressants in neuropathic cancer pain. Level of evidence is 1B. Now, all of, uh, I did mention about the flower, which I had mentioned. So it's the St. John's wort. That's the hyper, hypericum extract. It is used mainly for in mild to moderate. But is it FDA approved or is it recommended? No, because of the uncertainty in, in its dose. Thank you. I'm sorry, I had to rush. No, 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 no. Thank you, Raghavinder. I think it was such a fantastic uh, beginning. And uh, I think you have given more than half time to just to explain that how uh, a cancer patient can be benefited by just simple non-pharmacological therapy because, and you have given the scientific explanation that why they are depressed and why they are anxious. So there are questions, Raghavinder, you can start reading and uh, quickly you can start answering. We have two more minutes. And uh, I think there are there is there are question from Dr. Preeti. Uh, doctor, one doctor has asked what is the choice in elderly. So you can start answering Raghav Raghavinder. Ma'am, I can't see the. Okay, Dr. Question. Preeti, can you ask? Or uh, one question I can read because I have changed from laptop to uh, my iPhone. One question I can see that. What is the drug of choice in elderly group of patients? I, I think th you have explained it properly. Hmm? I think sertalin would be the easiest to start off with, ma'am, if the patient has got depressed. And I'm telling if there are complicated issues and concerns, cardiac issues, I would not be starting it. I've mentioned it right away. 
and sertraline would be the best to start off with if they have got cardiac issues and concerns um that's where i could actually mention hello hello dr yes, agrinder dr preeti go ahead yeah. go ahead yeah uh, dr agrinder said a uh, 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 tricyclic antidepressant is not good in head and neck cancer patient so which one is ideal drug Oh, ma'am, I would. Uh, why I mentioned was, if a patient is actually having a complete remission and there is no issues of dryness of mouth and other things, then I would use tricyclic antidepressants if it's a young patient. Whereas if it's an elderly patient who is actually having other comorbidities, then there will be a lot of problems which could be there because of the decreased uh, uh, salivation itself. The drug of choice there would be if the depression is there, the SSRIs which I mentioned. Then, if its pain is there, then we should use a small amount of norepinephrine and reuptake inhibition. So it depends upon the individual. What is the concern? What is the side effect profile which we are looking into, and what the comorbidities the patient already has got? If there is um, the glaucoma, urinary disturbances, prostate uh, hypertrophy, these and all will be actually aggravated by your tricyclic antidepressants. That's exactly what I mentioned. I did not mention you should never use. I should told. I no, didn't no, mention I same. Yeah. Yes, yes, I understand. But most of the patient have uh, neuropathic pain in head and neck cancer patient. We usually use uh, amitriptyline. That's why I ask. I understand what you mean to say. Yes, thank you, so, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much, Raghavendra. It's seven thirty-one, and thank you everyone for joining. More than hundred ten people have joined Raghavendra. This shows that how important this class was, and you have explained it so well. i think this was a wonderful class and it was of uh, uh, i think highest standards so please all the resident those who have not joined please look at these slides understand everything and understand the most important thing that non pharmacological therapy will work a lot in these patients thank you raghavinder and thank, thank you, you nisha and uh, archana see you all uh, thank you everyone for joining your presence is very very important for these classes and see you all next week on monday